Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to continue with this new series that we started, and uh, I'm very excited about this, as I mentioned last time. Uh, this is a very powerful uh, message, a very, very powerful lesson that we have to learn, uh, and something that we all have to uh, dig a little more deeper into. Uh, the six consecutive mitzvot that Rav Noach Weinberg, uh, you know, uh, taught uh, and brought out, and uh, most of the teachings that we have regarding this idea comes from him. Um, of course, you know, uh, the knowledge of Torah is everywhere, and uh, these have been talked about for hundreds and year, hundreds of years, uh, thousands of years. Um, so, you know, we're going to try to home in on these different ideas. Uh, but but uh, as we mentioned in the first class, these are mitzvot that we have to constantly be uh, thinking about, constantly be aware of, constantly be uh, reflecting on. So just, uh, just to continue, uh, we're starting number one. And we really just touched number one, and today hopefully we're going to uh, tackle number one. Uh, and if next week we might uh, continue on this a little bit and then move on. But as we said, mitzvah number one, is knowing there is a God. Right? Knowing there's a God, the existence of God. That's mitzvah number one. So we asked last week, and it's a very powerful question, right? First of the Ten Commandments is, no, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, right? And that's where we know this mitzvah of knowing there's a God. Question the commentaries ask is, one second. Logically, of course we have to know there's a God. So if you don't believe in God, so then you don't have to do any of the mitzvahs. Right? Because you don't believe in God. If you do believe in God, so then, I'm sorry, if you do do all the mitzvahs, so then of course you have to believe in God. Because you can't do be doing mitzvahs if you don't believe in God. And so the whole idea of doing mitzvahs is only if we believe in God. So why is this, oh, the first of the Ten Commandments, no, there's a God. By, by default, right? by default of having all the mitzvahs, automatically that means to say that we believe in God. So why do we have to have a separate mitzvah of believing there is a God? Why do we have to have a separate mitzvah? A very powerful, uh, very powerful question uh, to really make us think about what the depth of this mitzvah is. What's the depth of this idea of believing in God, believing that there's a God? What's really the depth behind it? So we, we started really talking about this last week. We, we just scraped the surface, so we're just going to start over again. The Chavos Avavos, the duties of the heart, says something very powerful. He says that it says in the Shema, in Deuteronomy, sorry, in Aleinu, we say in Aleinu, right? And it's a verse in Deuteronomy and Devarim, and it says like this, you shall know this day and understand it in your heart that the Almighty is God. You should know in this day in your heart, in your heart, right, that God is, uh, God is the Almighty is God. So the, the, the commentaries point out right, that typically, if I was talking about the idea of knowing God, what would I say? I would say you should know in your seichel, in your brain, in your intellect about God. What does it say in the Lenu, which is a verse in Deuteronomy in Devarim? Bilva Vecha in your heart. What does it mean to know in your heart? Why is why does it say you should know in your heart? Our heart feels, right? Our heart is emotion, right? When we whenever we speak about love, right? What do you have? You have a heart. Right? You have a heart for love. Right? That's an emotion. Right? If someone's heart's broken, they have an arrow through the heart, right? <laughs> but Heart is represents emotion. So why, right, when it talks about knowing God, why does it say Bilva Vecha in your heart? Um, just a, a reminder, um, we are taking questions during the class, uh, but uh, through chat, because I don't want to unmute everybody just not to make too much noise. So if anybody has any questions during the class, please feel free to uh, write it in the chat. Um, and I'll be more than happy to answer the questions. Same thing on Facebook Live. All right, please feel free to write a question, uh, and I'll be more than happy. Or if you want me to explain something again, uh, please feel free to write in the chat. That way we get the, the, the class going, but at the same time, the interaction that we love uh, in the classes. And of course, at the end of the class, we'll unmute everybody, and everybody could 
uh, speak away and ask whatever they want. Right? In the chat, you could also. So the commentaries, the Chavis Avavo says something very powerful. Right? The Chavis Avavo says right, that it's not, and I'll read you the code, it's not enough to intellectually know that God, that, uh, that God is in charge of everything. You must also know in your heart this emotional knowledge is much more profound and powerful because it affects how a person actually conducts his life. And I'll, read, and I'll say it again. The emotional knowledge is much more profound and powerful because it affects how a person actually conducts his life. For example, a child will jump down off the ledge into his father's arm or mother, completely confident that his father or mother will catch him. He's not thinking intellectually. It's because of his heart, his emotional connection. And if I'm standing on a ledge, okay, maybe I'm a little heavy. Right? You have to have something really strong, right? But, uh, right? but you know, someone standing on a ledge and you see a stranger, right? They know intellectually that the person will probably catch them, right? Uh, most probably they're not going to want them to get hurt. But you feel, still feel a uh, distance. You still feel not so secure because you don't have that emotional connection. The whole point of life is to strengthen your awareness of God. How do you know if, you, if you're really aware of God? Through trust in God. If you are, then you are willing to walk through the tightrope, right? So, that, so to speak, or jump off a cliff, so to speak. How do we connect to the emotional connection of God? What is a true emuna, as the word we use, faith, knowing that there's a God? Again, this is number one. All right, we're going to go through hopefully all of them, but number one is, right, believing in God. How do we know that where we're holding intellectually? I know God, and we spoke about this last week more, right? But just quickly repeat, I know there's a God, right? But we still sin. If you don't believe in God, that's a whole new topic. Right? We're, we're going with, the, and the whole class is going with the assumption that we believe in God. Because if you don't believe in God at all, so then why are you doing anything? Whatever level, why are you Yom Kippur, are you fast? Right? Why you don't eat ham, if that's what you do? Right? Why do you wear a kippah when you walk into a sanctuary? Why do you come to a sanctuary? Right? If you don't believe in God, right, so then we're on a whole different stage. So we, this class is with the premise that you believe in God. So one second, if you believe in God, so then why do, we, why do we do any sin? Why do we do everything God asks us to do? And the answer is because intellectual knowledge is not enough. Intellectual knowledge is not enough because we know a lot of things intellectually. I know that potatoes hurt me. I right? thank God not deathly, but they give me headaches. But every once in a while I cheat and I have some potato chips. I go to the convenience store, right, and I see the bag of chips and the real spicy ones, the jalapeno, and I, I need it. Intellectually, I know it's going to hurt me. All right? Oh, there's one more piece of cake. I shouldn't have it. How many times do we say that? Because intellectual knowledge is not enough. Intellectual knowledge starts the process. We have to have it. But it's not enough because what really makes us do what we're supposed to do what really puts everything in the, as we've spoken about a hundred times, the priorities of life is the emotional connection. Because when you have an emotional connection with someone, when you believe in someone emotionally, that deeper emotional connection, then you're willing to walk through fire. You, you believe in them 100%. That's how cults work. But we're not talking about a cult. We're talking about believing in God. So, the Chavis Avov is called this the Amuna, the trust in God, right? Trusting in God. And he gives four steps of how one should reflect on trusting in God. And I want to go through these four steps today. God willing, we'll get through all four, right? Uh, and uh, we'll move on next week. I want to talk about these four steps today. If we don't get through them, we don't get through them. Uh, but he talks about Chavis Avav is the path, the, the duties of the heart speaks about four steps of building trust in God. As we said, trust in God is the ultimate. Just like that child will jump off the ledge because he trusts 
in his father or mother. The trust. So step number one, says the Chavos HaVavos, is Almighty loves you with an abundant love. And it says we have to realize and connect to this idea that the Almighty Hashem, God, loves you with abundance of love. Right? There's no such thing. The closest thing that comes to it is a love of a parent to a child. Uh, parents know the, the love that they have to children, of course, healthy parents, right, is, 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 there's no boundaries, there's no, there's no borders to control it, to, com- to contain it, right? Uh, just because sometimes you get upset doesn't mean to say that you don't love your child. On the contrary, that's why you love your child. We'll get to that. Says the Chavos the Almighty is our Father in Heaven, as it says in the Torah, right? Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, right? Our Father in Heaven, Right? We have to realize that God is our parent. Right? And everything he does right, is love. We have to connect to this realization that God loves us. Yeah, we say, uh, uh, Shem loves me. No, no, no. We have to really connect to it on a deeper level. Right? Deep down, we know that God loves us. Right? How do we know this? How do we know that deep down God, that we lo- that God loves us? This, the next, don't get confused, right? just to clarify, don't get confused. The next step, right, of the, the six mitzvahs is, right, um, the next one is that, um, sorry, uh, the number four, number four is love God, right? Don't get confused with loving God, our obligation to love God, which is further down after number four, right, mitzvah number four. In what we're talking about now, how do we believe in God? How do we trust God? How do we make an emotional connection with God? It is realizing that God loves us. That God loves each one of us. And what's, how do we prove to ourselves that God loves us? Very simple test. What's the first thing that comes to your mind right, when you're in trouble? Please, God. Now, it's become a catchphrase, right? Now, we say, Baruch Hashem, thank God, right? With God's help. As is a very famous saying, and I've used this many times, it's a very famous saying, there is no atheist in a foxhole. Whenever someone's in trouble, right, 90% of humanity, right, again, we're not talking about people that don't believe in God, but someone that believes in God, right, and even those that don't, but I don't want to get into that. As the phrase says, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Right? But those that believe in God, when we're in trouble, when we need help, what do we do? We open up Psalms. We pray. We have a private conversation with God. You put up a poster on, uh, on, Saint, uh, on uh, Scott Mills Road that says, God help uh, this country. Right? <laughs> I don't know if anybody's seen that. Right? On Scott Mills. Right? Big sign. God help this country. But we have a conversation with God. As, as, whatever level of a belief that we have, we go to synagogue on Yom Kippur, maybe. All right, then we do the Passover Seder. Wherever you're holding, but do you believe in some level of God? When push comes to shove, when we really need that help, who do we rely on? Who do we ask for help from? God. Please, God, help us. And whoever's in trouble, praise to God. Right? It doesn't make a difference where you're holding. And if we build this up, and if we recognize this idea and reflect on it, that God loves us, we start building a trust in God also. And, and I just want to, because everything we learn is applicable for all life, all parts of our life. Right? We, we try to make this very practical in our daily lives also. This is very practical in our daily lives in building our relationship with God. But this, guys, this is also building a relationship with other people. How do you build a relationship with other people? It's by realizing that they love you. Yes, we're going to speak about later on that you have to love them. You have to love God. But right now we're talking about how do we build a relationship with God? How do we realize that? How do we build that trust in God? We build a trust in God is by realizing and saying that God loves me. God loves me. He's our Father in heaven. 
And when we realize that and connect to that, we'll, we'll walk, we'll, we'll take the tightrope. We'll, we'll walk whatever God tells us to do. We understand it, we don't understand it. It sounds foreign to us, it sounds strange to us, but we trust in God. That that child will jump off the ledge. And that's the same thing with relationships, communities, countries. We have to realize that the other person loves you. You hope they don't, and you have to start a relationship. But if you are in a relationship, the other person loves you. Trust them. How do you build trust in a relationship? Husbands and wives, coworkers, they should have trust. Because there's a level of love. Again, different levels. But back to our topic. That's number one, says the Chavos Avavos. The duties of the heart. That God loves you. Number one. Just for those that just joined us, first of all, thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, write it in the, the chat. And I'll be more than happy to answer. And of course, after the class, you're more than happy to ask. Number two. Says the, the, the Chavis Avavos, number two is direct line. A direct line. Right? A direct line. What does it mean, a direct line? Right? So, you know, the U.S. Defense Department spends millions of dollars each year to send broadcast signals to distant stars, right? Uh, sometimes it'll take years, thousands of years to reach certain places. Now, imagine if they ever got an answer. And even just in hello, the whole world would be flabbergasted. Like, oh, my gosh. Right? Yeah, finally, we got a, a, a connection. Getting an answer back from someone. And, uh, you know, the other day, I was on the phone with a certain agency for about 45 minutes. I had, oh, thank God I was, I was uh, not on my cell phone. I was on the house phone. Right? So I didn't use up all my battery. Right? <laughs> but uh, I have unlimited minutes also. I think most people have now. But uh, I was on my house phone. And, uh, you know, I was had on speaker and I was walking from one room to another room and going outside and doing all the things, you know, waiting 45 minutes. Finally, someone says, hello. I said, oh, hello, hello, hello. Right? Oh, great. I finally got someone. Right? Connection. Right? And then the worst is when they say hello and then you say hello and then they're like, oh, you go back to the, you know, to the, to the song. They're like, ah. Right? Oh, yeah, you finally got a connection. I got a connection. God is always listening to, we have a direct line to God, right? Have you ever prayed and had your prayers answered? A study says four out of five people say yes. Four out of five people say that when they pray, they had their, their prayers answered one way or another. This is unbelievable. And I know personally myself, not always are we happy with the answer, right? But we get having our, our prayers answered. Sometimes it takes some time. Sometimes we don't see it. But if we really think about our lives, really, if we really think about what we pray about, excuse me, we have our prayers answered nine out of ten times. We have a direct line to God. Right? We, we ask for God for help. And most times we get the answer that we want. Not always. But we get the answer that we want. The mitzvah of belief in God means living with the reality there is th that you're not alone. God's awareness and attention to every detail right, is with you. He picks up the signals when you ask. Can you imagine when I call, maybe the agency has, you know, I don't know, a thousand people calling at a time. Maybe, probably not. I had to, it took 45 minutes to get my answer, my, my answer, my phone answered. There's millions of people in the world. And God says, hey, Avi Feigenbaum, I'm going to listen to you. And I'm listening to you all the time, but I'm also listening to that person. I'm listening. But each one of us have our own personal attention. A direct line, God is listening to you. God is aware of you. God wants to have that relationship with you. When we recognize that, when we build that up, then we start having trust in God too. Because one of the ways of having trust, number one, as we mentioned, right, he loves you. Number two, also, he's paying attention to you. Right? How many times have you asked, are you paying attention? 
And then the more you ask this question, the less you trust the person. The relationship starts getting, but because are you paying attention? Are you listening to me? Do you care about the details of my life? Are, are, not only are you paying attention to what I'm telling you, but are you paying attention to what I'm doing? That is a relationship that builds trust, that builds amuna, that builds that emotional amuna, as we mentioned. The amuna of God, the relationship with God, can't just be intellectual. Yes, intellectually, I know. It has to be God created the world, but nothing, something can't come from nothing. Right? And again, I'm not going into the whole thing. Intellectually, yeah, I believe in God. Right? My human body is, is unbelievable. Right? Yeah, they're still mapping out all the things. And we don't even know. I was talking to a conversation with someone the other day. Right? Um, I don't remember who it was. Right? We were talking about the spacecraft that just went up into space. Right? The new space, the unbelievable. Right? The new spacecraft. It's reusable and this. Unbelievable stuff. But the person asked me, said, I don't get it. We still haven't gone to the depth of the ocean. We're going out of space. We still haven't gone to the depth of the ocean. So intellectually, it's easy to believe in God. But as we said, that's not enough because we believe in God and we're still lacking that faith because we're lacking the emotional component of faith. And step number two of building that emotional connection of faith is realizing and connecting that God cares about you. Not only does he love you, but he, he, he's paying attention to you. He, he, he's, you have a direct line. He answers your prayers. He's watching your moves. He cares about what you're doing. Millions of people, yes, each one of us, he connects with. That's step number two. Step number three, he does it all, right? Does it all. What does it mean? Right? Imagine, right? Your uh, your parents. And now, your some, most people here are parents, right? Uh, you give someone, right? Let's say you give your child the money. You give your child a dollar. Your parents gave you a dollar. You give someone else money, right? By you giving something to someone else, you are diminishing from your own net worth. Okay. Doesn't mean it's a lot. A dollar, right? Doesn't really hurt you so much but you're still taking away from yourself, right? You give something to someone else, you're taking away from yourself, right? Now, if you give a lot, so then you don't have the ability to help the person because now you gave them too much and not too much, but by giving someone else something, you're taking away from yourself. And, and therefore, right, it, we, by, in you map with another human, we have to be constantly aware, right? Could that person really help me? Right? Uh, is he will? Will he be willing? Is it going to be uh, financially uh, safe for for that person to help me, or emotionally safe? Because even if we give our emotions, we're taking away from ourselves. But with God Almighty, gives you billions of dollars. It doesn't diminish his net worth. God gives; he does it all. He means to say, he constantly is giving, and whatever he gives doesn't diminish from him. Think about how many miracles God made for you. Think about how much God has given you since you were born into this world. And still, it doesn't take away from anything that God can still give. Everything God does is for you is a gift. Whatever you want from God is nothing compared to what he already gives you and what he could give you. God sustains the universe every second. There's nothing that can, can, can stop God. Your parents, teachers, and boss are delivery people. Every single thing you have is sent from God. Knowing this gives you confidence to trust that God will continue to give you everything you need. Very important. Everything you need. Trust in God, building that emotional relationship with God and faith in God is realizing that how much God gives you, he can always give you more. And how much God did give you. So I, I can trust in God. I don't have to worry that the bank's going to empty. I don't have to worry that, uh, you know, some, uh, the, the person's going to fall out uh, with political favor with the government. He won't be able to help me anymore. I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, the person's not going to be around for much longer. Health or whatever it is which is one of the things that we stop, we, we're, it stops us from trusting people. 
because I'm going to give over so much stress, but then Evan Dew won't be able to help me. God was always, God will always be able to, this, it does it all. God always can help you. God has, and how much God has given you shows that. And how much he gives everybody in the universe. Simultaneously, everything's happening. God's making everything go. Again, this is with the knowledge that we believe that God exists. So when we reflect on this and we think about this, start building our trust in God. Start wanting to have more faith in God because we know that God's the one that can help us out. The one, God's the one to rely on. You know, and again, this takes us back to relationships. Of course, there's no one, no physical person that can do this. But why does a child trust in their parent, a healthy relationship? Because they think their, their parent is a superhuman. How many times do you remember as kids or you hear kids of, my daddy, he could, uh, and other people, my daddy could. Because right? kids think their parents are the greatest and they could do anything. As they get older, they realize not so much, and that's why you have teenagers. <laughs> that's probably not why, but. But trust comes from also realizing that the person can help you. It's a, it's a, it's a buildup. And therefore, we have to constantly remind ourselves that God could give, God has given, God continues to give. And, 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 and God does, doesn't take away anything from God when he gives. And then, as we said, whatever he gives you, you know it's, it's what you need. Because this is building up on the other two that we spoke about. Number one, God loves you. Right? Number two, you have a direct line. Number three, everything that everything God, whatever God gives you and has given you doesn't diminish from his ability to continue to give you. And whatever he has given you, whatever he does give you is for your own benefit because he loves you. Because he loves you. So many times, you say, well, if God loves me, right? If God could give anything, so, you know, uh, then let me make sure that, uh, you know, I don't have to... Uh, I get the, all my bills paid, right? Uh, make sure there's no hunger in the world. And all these, these are wonderful things. And of course we want that. But there's a rhyme and reason why things happen. It's all part of our growth. It's all part of our growth. And we're going to talk about that a little more in the next one. But everything that God gives you is for your benefit. It's what you need. That's number... Three. Number four, excuse me. Right? Number four is best of everything. God, guys, listen to this. This is so important. God doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't need you to eat kosher food or to observe Shabbos or to give charity or to buy Israeli bonds. But to go out fast on Yom Kippur, eat matzah on Passover, God doesn't need that. Well, I'm doing God a favor by going to synagogue or paying, giving money to charity or things like that. That's how we think. God doesn't need anything like that from you. God doesn't need everything. He has everything. But God is a giver. God only wants to give. Everything in the world is for your own benefit. God wants to give. And one of the things God wants to give is the ability for us to transform our physical body to something more spiritual. And therefore, he gives us the mitzvot. So when we keep Shabbat, or we eat kosher, whatever level you're doing that, when we give charity, and we buy Israeli bonds, and when we fast in Kippur and eat matzah on Passover, we're doing that for ourselves, to build our relationship with God, to trust God. Because as we said before, what God wants us to do is for our benefit. So if we trust in God, and we believe that everything he wants from us is for our own benefit, so then when we're doing it, we're doing it really for ourselves because we know that this is for our benefit. It's not that I'm doing you a favor. Oh God, I'm doing you a favor. It's like a boss asking a worker to do certain things. Oh, I'm doing it for the boss? No, you're doing it for yourself that you can get a paycheck. 
you're doing it for yourself that you learn the skills to be able to grow in the company and get a better job. Don't think that I'm doing it for the boss. You're doing it for yourself. It's not selfless. It's not being selfish, sorry. Because you need to feed your family. But you're doing it because you trust in God that that's what God told you to do, and you trust in Him. So number four in trust, and this is building up on the other ones, is realizing that God does not need anything from you. Oh, I get brownie points. Oh, God, I, I did this. Be happy, God. I've heard this before. And I'm a fault at it sometimes to myself. I'll be happy, God. Now we're no we are doing it because we trust in god that god knows what's best for us and therefore we're really doing it for ourselves all right so you ask god please give me a million hundred million dollars be nice right just live off the interest <laughs> right? but maybe it's not good for you Maybe you become maybe you'll become arrogant, greedy, excessive. Maybe you'll you're you'll you'd hire others to accomplish your goals and you miss out on making or try or effort or try. Maybe God knows that for you to have a lot of money, you'll just sit on your couch, right, and eat potato chips, right, and that's it. And you won't exercise any of your strength, you won't become a better person by it. And therefore, God says, I don't want you to have that money. It's hard. Trust me. I know. We all know. Be easier. But the situations that you put in are there to help you grow. If it's a hard boss, if it's a community, right? if it's a country, if it's a spouse, if it's children, if it's finances, if it's health, whatever difficulties you have or blessings that you have, are there to help you grow and see what are you going to do with that? How are you going to react? As the famous saying goes, puts me years from heaven. Everything's from heaven except for the fear of heaven. What does it mean, fear of heaven? We're not talking about fear of heaven right now. That's the next one. But what it means, say the commentary, is that what is up to us, our free will, is our reaction to what are we going to do with what's given to us? Certain things that are out of control that doesn't take away our free will. Our free will is, are we going to trust in God that what he gave us, what he didn't give us, is for our own benefit? Because God doesn't need anything from us. God is just a giver. God wants the best for us. And therefore, everything that God does for us is for our own good. I've given this example a hundred times, and I've seen this many places, right? But it's a good example, and it's something that we have, to, we have to always remind ourselves. You know, when a child asks something from you, and this happens very often, of course, right? And you say, sorry, no. Are you being mean to the child? You don't want the child, in a healthy relationship. You don't want the child to have it because, eh, I'm just being mean, I'm in a grumpy mood. No, you know that that's not good for the child right now. They can't have the latest technology because that's not healthy for their growth. They can't be on the television all the time or because they have to develop themselves. They have to get exercise. They have to be outside. They have to learn. They can't have candy all the time because it's not healthy for their body. When a parent right, tells a child or a guardian, no, 99% of the time, it's out of love. It's out of because you want the best for your child. You want your child to grow. You want your child to be better. It's not because you want to be mean to your child. So as we start, built this up from the beginning, four steps of trusting in God, building that emotional relationship to God, not just intellectually. Let's first, first and foremost remind ourselves God loves us. So if God loves us, when he says no, it's not because he doesn't want us to have it, because he knows it's for our best. God, we have a direct line with God. 
So when we don't have something or we have a hard time with something, we have to remember, pray to God, and God is listening and notices. It's not because God is somewhere else playing cards within the spiritual world up there. No, God is focusing on all of us. And he still said no, so it must be for our best. Not because, oh, you know, yeah, God loves us, but maybe he didn't recognize that I need this. You know, that sometimes we all go, oh, maybe he doesn't know, right? He doesn't realize how hard, hard things are for me. He doesn't realize how hard this person is, treat, bad this person is treating me. No, we have direct line. God sees everything. He answers our prayers. And, and he sees everything that's happening. So when God says no, or when God gives us a challenge, it's because God loves us and God knows that we could accomplish it. And this is the best for us. Because God doesn't need anything from us. He loves us. And he recognizes everything. Step number two, one and two. Step number three, as we said, and he does it all. Well, you know, maybe God can help me because uh, he ran out of funds. Right? Maybe he ran out of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, moving me from one place to another place because, uh, I don't know, right now his uh, powers have diminished. And God is not a superhero. Right? God is not Thor or others that they lose their powers. Or there's other people that are stronger than him. I know, we, with all the superheroes flash and this and that, we think sort of, uh, we picture God like that a little bit. No. Right? God has it all. Nothing, God's powers never diminish. As much as he gives, you can give a hundred times more. So when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we like it, of course he answers our prayers. When God says, no, sorry, you're not going to get that. You're not going to win the lottery. Your business deal is not going to work out properly for you. Or, sorry, you're going to have to deal with that difficult person. It's not because God doesn't have the power to change it. Because God trusts and knows that this is the best for you. Because God knows more about what's good for us than we know ourselves. So let's start from number one. God loves you, so he wants only the best for you. God has a direct line to you, so he recognizes, he knows what your problems are. It's not like he forgot, it's not somewhere else, and not that he didn't notice. God has all the power and he never diminishes his power. So then, so it's not because God doesn't have the ability to help you. It's not because God doesn't have the ability to put a pot of gold on your lawn. It all boils down to number four. Because God is always looking out for the best for you. Because God doesn't need anything from us. God just wants to give us. So now one, two, and three, really, if you think about it, explain number four. When we realize that, that God is really out there for us and loves us and wants the best for us, and therefore the mitzvot, even though they're harder, they're more expensive, kosher food is more expensive, and Shabbat, yeah, oh my gosh, I have to walk at Shul. And again, every person on their level, taking it one step higher from where you are, and it's a little more difficult, financially difficult, emotionally difficult, you know, socially difficult, other people, this, that. But God is giving you these challenges for whatever level you are, spiritually, physically, it's because he knows that this is the best for you. And we have to trust in that. We have to build our relationship with God through that. Because as we said, he loves you. He's a direct line. He knows everything that's going on. And he has the power to change anything. He knows his power never diminishes. So if he puts you in this situation, that means you say that he loves you. And there's nothing more powerful than knowing that God loves you and everything he does is for your own benefit. And therefore, grab, grab the horns, the bull by the horns, and say, I'm going to try to accomplish this because I know this is the best for me. That is trust in God. That's an emotional trust in God. Building the emotion, the relationship through emotion, through connection. Not just through intellect. The intellect allows us to connect to the emotion by thinking about these things. We need the two things. And therefore, it says the Chavis Avavos, that's why it says in Aleinu, as we started off, and as it's a verse in Deuteronomy, that's why it says, right, and you should know God in your heart. Right? It's, it's a verse of you should know God in your heart. 
And it's fascinating. You find this all the time in Jewish literacy. When we talk about knowledge, we talk about the heart. We talk about the lave. Lave yodea, lave mechashe, lave thinks. Is because knowledge is not enough intellectually. It has to be emotionally connected to you, as we just explained. Trust. Trust in God. So I'm just going to do a very quick recap, and then we'll take questions. We spoke about the idea, number one. Today we spoke about number one, knowing there's a God. We asked the question, what does it mean knowing God? Of course you know God. If you believe in God, that's why we do all the mitzvot. If I don't believe in God, then I don't do any mitzvot. So automatically when I'm doing the mitzvot, I'm showing that I believe in God. Or whatever level mitzvah you're doing. And we answered that the mitzvah is telling us something deeper. It says the Chavos Avav, it says it's not only intellectually knowing God, like we just explained, but it's emotionally knowing God. And how do we emotionally know God? We trust God. You have a faith and trust in God, just like a child would jump off the ledge and know that the father will catch him. So too, we jump off the ledge and we know God will take care of us. How do we build that trust? We spoke about four steps. Number one, God loves you. You, love, you have to love God. That's the next step. But in trust is that God loves you. We spoke about what that means that God loves you. Number two, step number two is a direct line. God is looking out for you. God answers your prayers. And you don't have to worry that God missed something. Trust God because he knows everything that's going around you. He sees everything and he's constantly watching over you. You have a direct line. Number three, right? his power never diminishes. He has it all. He could do everything. He has given you so much. All that he's given you, life and the world and species and everything. God has the ultimate power and God's power will never diminish. He's not a superhero. God's power will never diminish the trust in God. Number four, as we just explained, really all three really lead to number four. Right? God doesn't need anything from you. All God wants is to give to you. Can't find anybody. Everybody needs something from someone else. God doesn't need anything from us. When we do the mitzvot, when God gives us challenges, it's all for us to grow. And when we realize that, our trust in God will be the greatest. Because one of the things that hurts our trust is, why is it so difficult for me? Why is it so difficult for other people? We don't have all the answers why. But trust in God, right? That God wants to give to you. And everything that he does is for your benefit, for you to grow. Because he loves you. He's always watching out after you. He, didn't, he, he did not notice something in the world. And his power never diminished that he can't fix something or help something. So whatever's going on, Whatever he asks us from us, it's because it's for our benefit to grow and for us to become better people to transform our physical body into something spiritual, you're going closer to God. That is how we build our trust in God. And that, say the commentaries, the deeper meaning behind the first of the six consecutive mitzvahs of trusting, believing in God. Believing in God and trusting in God emotionally. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to stop the recording now.